Okay, thank you. <clears throat> well, thanks for asking me to speak today. Um, I'm gonna talk about the social cost of carbon and the role it plays in pricing carbon. So in other words, using marginal damages as a way of pricing carbon. Uh, I feel a little awkward talking about this in a country where the carbon price is a target consistent price, but um, I think it's important to calculate the social cost of carbon. I'll argue for this. And after lunch, Michael Greenstone will argue even more forcefully for it. So what I'm gonna do is to talk about really how the social cost of carbon has been calculated by the US government. How did they calculate it during the Obama administration? Bill Nordhaus gave you a number, um, which is the current interim number at 3%. What happened at the, in 2016 was that the government came to the US National Academy of Sciences and asked how should we improve our estimates, our empirical estimates of the social cost of carbon. I was fortunate enough to co-chair a committee, along with Richard Newell, president of RFF, to give recommendations to the federal government. Uh, unfortunately, our report came out the week before Donald Trump was inaugurated. And so <clears throat> during the Trump administration, the progress towards improving estimates of the social cost of carbon really lay at universities, at the University of Chicago and at other universities. And a lot of work was also done at Resources for the Future. I have an affiliation with Resources for the Future, but I was actually not part of this project. What I will present to you today are some revised estimates of the social cost of carbon produced by RFF. And I'm gonna end by talking about why I think we really do need to calculate empirically the social cost of carbon. So to make sure that we're all on the same page, we are talking here about, as Rick said, the present value of damages from emitting a ton of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We would hope that empirical estimates, bottom-up estimates that you'll be hearing more about after lunch, would reflect impacts on agriculture, energy use, human health, property damage from increased flood risk, from wildfires, and so forth and so on. When you're calculating the social cost of carbon, you have to remember that a ton of carbon that's emitted into the atmosphere today is going to be there for centuries. 30% of the ton will be there in 300 years, and so when you're calculating empirically the social cost of carbon, you've got to predict what the world's going to look like for the next 300 years. You have to generate distributions for population, GDP, emissions of all greenhouse gases. You're gonna be adding a small amount of carbon dioxide to a baseline path to calculate the social cost of carbon. But it's really these socioeconomic futures that you have to start with. Then once you have those, climate scientists can help you predict what this pulse of CO2 will do to mean global temperature, what it will do to changes in regional temperature, to sea level rise, and so forth. The third step is to look at the impact of these temperature changes, these climate changes, on damages, to both quantify these and monetize them. And finally, they have to be discounted to the present. So, the US government began doing this in 2010, um, an interagency working group was formed with actually support from Michael Greenstone and colleagues at EPA were the ones who actually did a lot of the heavy lifting. What they did was to take three well-known integrated assessment models, DICE, FUND, and PAGE, and they wanted to you know, harmonize what went into these models. So for the first step, for these socioeconomic paths, they took five scenarios from the Stanford Energy Modeling Forum. They assumed that they were equally likely. Climate sensitivity, the impact of a doubling of atmospheric CO2 concentrations on mean global temperature, that distribution was harmonized across the three integrated assessment models. And then the parameter uncertainty in fund and page was carried through the simulations. So, what they did was to run 150,000 Monte Carlo simulations, <clears throat> 50,000 for each model, 
for each of three discount rates for 2.5%, 3%, 5%. And what you're going to see on the next slide is really the distribution of the social cost of carbon corresponding to each of these discount rates. So this is the social cost of carbon in 2020 dollars for a ton of CO2 emitted in 2020. At a 5% discount rate, the distribution is the green bars. It's very concentrated. As you lower the discount rate to 3%, the distribution has a longer tail, and a longer tail still when you use a 2.5% discount rate, which is what the pink bars are. So you know, if you focused on 5%, the social cost of carbon would be $14. At 3%, which is what the government does focus on and what Bill talked about this morning, it's $51. At 2.5%, it's $76. Okay, so what happened when Donald Trump became president? Well, the interagency working group was disbanded and the edict was that we could look only at damages to the United States rather than damages to the world. And also we, could, we had to use in computing the social cost of carbon a discount rate of 7%, which is the pre-tax rate of return on capital as estimated by the, the US government. So the social cost of carbon fell to single digit number uh, during the Trump administration. However, as soon as Biden became president, the IWG was reconstituted. The graph that you just saw are the interim estimates that were issued by the government in February of 2021. And a new estimate, or a new set of distributions, was to be prepared by January of this year. Um, various things have happened, and it's likely, I would say, that revised estimates will be released sometime in the fall of this year. Okay, so you know, how can the estimates that you just saw, how can they be improved? And the answer is, for each of those four steps, there's something that can be done to improve the estimates. In terms of the first point here, um, the appropriate choice of socioeconomic scenarios and emission paths, those certainly can be improved beyond just taking five Stanford Energy Modeling Forum paths. Um, can the climate portions of the three integrated assessment models be improved? How can the damage estimates underlying DICE Fund and PAGE be updated to reflect recent research on climate impacts? That's what Michael's going to be talking about this afternoon. Um, and then finally, how should discounting be done? Should it be done at a constant exponential rate or some other way? Okay, so uh, the National Academy of Sciences was asked to make recommendations about how to improve the social cost of carbon. The committee, which I co-chaired with Richard Newell, consisted of four well-known climate scientists as well as seven economists. And what we really said was this, we said, the federal government shouldn't simply take integrated assessment models as they already exist. What they should do is really calculate their, compute their own integrated assessment model by taking each of the steps of the analysis and having people who are experts in each area do those calculations. Uh, a nicer way of describing this is actually a graph uh, that Michael and Tama Carton, Carlton put together. Um, you know, we would have somebody do the socioeconomic paths. This would, that distribution of those paths would feed into the climate model. The distribution over climate impacts would feed into the damages mod module and so forth and so on. Um, there are important questions such as equity weighting. Do you want to weight the damages even in PPP terms in India the same as you do in the United States? There are eth no, ethical questions here. But basically this was the advice that we gave to the federal government. We also said to do things that are a little more specific, at least in the short term. 
And what I'm going to show you in a few slides is actually what happens when these recommendations are implemented. Okay. So um, statistical methods and expert elicitation should be used to project future GDP, population growth, and emissions. Okay, I will show you the results of doing this um, by resources for the future. The link between emissions and climate should use a simple Earth system model. The well-defined diagnostic tests were ones developed by Miles Allen and other climate scientists on the committee. They also developed such a model which has the acronym FAIR, Finite Amplitude Impulse Response Model. Um, damage calculations should reflect the recent scientific literature, and future damages should be discounted at a rate reflecting the rate of economic growth underlying the damage projections. Um, this was discussed briefly by Rick. Um, in terms of what we said to the federal government, it was you really should be using a Ramsey-like discounting formula. It's important to take into account correlation between climate damages and the discount rate, and this is at least a practical way of doing it when the government's doing these calculations. Okay, so, oops, too fast. Um, so in order to do these social futures, um, what was done was to extend the UN's statistical model for population to the year 2300. Um, expert elicitation, experts in all three of these areas actually were convened, and formal expert elicitation was used to derive the results you're gonna see on the next few slides. To predict future economic growth, Muller, Stock, and Watson used data on over 100 countries for 118 years to predict long-run growth in per capita GDP. This was also augmented by formal expert elicitation. And then given these predictions, and again, these are distributions of possible futures, experts were asked to actually um, come up with associated greenhouse gas emission production, uh, predictions, sorry. Um, if you want to read more about this, you know, it's fine to uh, circulate the slides, you can go to this, this link. Okay, so what you're looking at here are projections of world population times on the horizontal axis to the year 2300, population on the vertical. The black line here is the median of the prediction of world population distribution. So the median is, is peaking somewhere in the next century at around uh, 11 billion people. The greeny gray, I don't think, I'm not sure all these things are gonna come out so well on this slide. There is actually sort of a greeny gray um, funnel shape thing here, which is the 90% prediction interval. Um, so you can see, you know, by the year 2300, that's going from about 5 billion to 20 billion people. There is another um, area here which unfortunately doesn't show up very well on the slide, and it's, but if you have the slides, you can look at it. It's a light gray area that is the 98% prediction interval. The, dot, the dash lines actually correspond to the IPCC shared socioeconomic pathways, which we don't have time to go through, but again, if you have the slides, you can take a look at them and see how the expert distribution, and again, I'm sorry you can't really see the 98% Prediction interval because you know, it does contain more information than you're seeing right now. Sorry about that. Okay, in terms of future economic growth rates, the median projection here is showing a per capita economic growth rate of about you know, somewhere between one and 2%. If you could see, I'm sorry you can't, the 98% prediction interval you would actually see some possibility of obviously you know, less than 8% of having growth rates as high as 4% or negative growth rates. The, uh, you know, the, the, the uncertainty bounds here, and again, I'm sorry you can't see all of them, um, do encompass the shared socioeconomic pathways. Where these predictions really differ from the IPCC predictions 
is in the case of emissions. So the median prediction here by these experts is that emissions have more or less peaked. This is the median prediction. Again, there's great uncertainty bounds here, and unfortunately, you can't see them all. But emissions are peaking you know, basically now and slowly declining to the year 2300. Um, even if you did have a look at the 98% projection interval, it would not include um, RCP 8.5, the you know, extreme emissions scenario, and it barely includes actually uh, the 7.01. So what happens if you put this into the climate model, into the FAIR model, what you get here are projections of mean global temperature to the year 2300. Um, again, the median of the distribution of mean global temperature goes up to about three degrees Celsius. The <clears throat> chances of being below two degrees Celsius by the year 2100 are very small. They're, again, I'm sorry, you can't see the other bounds. Uh, there's some you know, positive probability, but very small. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do is just say a little bit more about the climate modeling and then move on to Okay, I guess I'm okay on time, sorry. Um, and then move on to some of the projections that these figures uh, lead to. Okay, so what this graph here is showing is the impact of a 100 gigaton increase in carbon dioxide showing its impact on mean global temperature. So temperature is on the vertical axis, time goes out 200 years, and you know, as you can see here, the, the red line is indicating that the peak impact of this, gigaton, these, this 100 gigaton impulse is gonna happen within 20 years of when it's emitted. If you look at the corresponding predictions from Page Fund, and this is DICE 2016, you don't see the impact happening that fast. You ultimately see a higher impact actually with DICE and Fund, but it, it happens later. What you're looking at the bottom of the screen at is the present value of a dollar discounted at 2%. So you can see that the force of discounting, given you're gonna be discounting climate damages, um, really bites. And the fact that you, know, you would have this pulse occurring faster or the peak impact occurring faster will have an impact on the social cost of carbon. Finally, and I feel like I'm really sort of the opening act for Michael's talk in the, in the afternoon, this is a, this is a graph that um, was produced by the Climate Impact Lab. What you're looking at here is the years in which various articles were published that constituted the basis of the fun Dyson page models used by the interagency working group. So you can see, as maybe having a hard time seeing, but we're talking about publications dating from the 90s. In the case of the fund model, um, and then in the DICE models, you know, sort of similarly in the 90s, early 2000s, early 2000s in the page model. But what you're seeing on the right is actually this explosion of literature on climate damages, literally hundreds of papers being published after 2016 or between 2016 and 2021. So the idea is what's gonna happen when you actually, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, what is going to happen when you incorporate those into the social cost of carbon? Okay, so let me actually move on here to discounting. So the recommendation, and again, this was to generate correlation whether it's positive or negative, between climate damages and the rate of growth of the economy. If you think about each of these scenarios in the first step of calculating the social cost of carbon, there's gonna be some probability attached to each of those scenarios. But for a given scenario, what you're, seeing, what you're going to have is some path of growth in per capita GDP along that scenario. Um, we said you should discount 
damages in year T back to the present using a Ramsey-like formula. Um, in the US government, you don't use terms like the Ramsey formula. You may, in, you may be able to say that in France or in, in the UK, but not in the United States. But basically, you're going to take the pure rate of time preference plus the elasticity of marginal utility with respect to uh, <clears throat> consumption, the absolute value of that, times the rate of per capita income growth. Okay. Um, as long as damages are going to vary with per capita income growth, then indeed you will be allowing for this correlation. Obviously the question is how are you going to cho choose rho and eta? Well, you could choose them so that you match observed market rates, uh, maybe 2% and 3%. Things have been creeping up, of course. Oh, sorry. I can't, I'm, I hit the wrong button, pardon me. Um, go back again. Uh, sorry. Okay, pardon me. So um, you can choose row and eta, although obviously there are an infinite number of rows and etas that would give you 2% um, or 3%, so we'll talk about that on the next slide. But the term that you know, we gave to this is that this is stochastic discounting because the discount rate's certain along each socioeconomic path, but the path is uncertain. Therefore, the um, discount rate is uncertain, and the certainty equivalent discount rate corresponding to a, different, to a set of parameters um, will differ. So what you're seeing on this slide is the first uh, line is the certainty equivalent discount rate if you choose rho to be 0.8% and eta to be 1.53. The second line is the certainty equivalent discount rate if rho is 0.1%, eta is 1.25. These paths match pretty well work the work by Bauer and Rudenbosch, sorry. And so what you're going to see are estimates of the social cost of carbon um, using these parameters. And what you'll see are this. You're t we're going to take the socioeconomic projections that you saw on those four slides, um, round two of the FAIR model. The basis for damages on what you're going to look at is the 2016 DICE model. And then you're going to see stochastic discounting using the two sets of parameters on the previous slide. OK, so here is the result. You're looking um, at this sort of greeny-gray distribution of the social cost of carbon, which corresponds to targeting things to the 3% near-term rate and has an average social, uh, mean social cost of carbon of $56. Um, if you use the 2% parameters, you get the purple curve. Um, the mean social cost of, cost of carbon goes up to $171. And I think you know, the first reaction you might have when you look at this is, gosh, this doesn't look a whole lot different than what happened when the interagency working group came up with their numbers. This doesn't look too, too different. But the point is, this actually is, is quite different um, than what happens if you discount at a constant exponential rate. OK. So um, if you simply took all of those assumptions, dice damages, the projection over socioeconomic futures, the FAIR model, and you used a constant exponential rate of 3%, you would get a mean social cost of carbon of $125. And if you used a constant exponential rate of 2%, you'd get a mean social cost of carbon of almost $800. Okay, this is reflecting the fact that distribution of damages has a long tail. If you do use constant exponential discounting and you really don't allow for the correlation between damages and the growth of the economy, then indeed you get these very inflated numbers for the social cost of carbon. Um, the slide also notes that DICE damages, 
are positively correlated with GDP. They have a positive climate beta. Um, if one were to do these calculations using some of the damage estimates that Michael has, has come up with, for example, for mortality, that might not be the case. Um, Resources for the Future um, has produced, but not yet published, um, new social cost of carbon estimates that reflect everything you've seen, but also update the damage functions. Okay, so um, I guess I think it feel like, especially before Michael's talk, I should give a pitch as to why I think it really is important to calculate the social cost of carbon. Um, we know that the UK abandoned it in 2009 because there's uncertainty about the social cost of carbon. Indeed, there's a whole distribution. And the idea of a target consistent price of replacing the marginal cost of reducing or replacing the SCC with the marginal cost of reducing carbon dioxide along a desired path is what was advocated by Joe Stiglitz and Nick Stern. It's also the approach that's taken in the Kine report. The questions obviously are how do you determine the desired emissions path and shouldn't the desired path in some sense reflect damages. There's also of course the issue of the marginal cost of reducing emissions along a desired path is going to depend on what policies you choose to achieve it. So um, once again I think it's important Regardless of whether your approach or your view is, well, we should perhaps use a target consistent price, whatever temperature target you choose, you are implicitly making judgments about damages and what the value of avoiding them is. Um, that All of that uncertainty is not being really avoided, but just sort of swept under the rug when you don't look at the social cost of carbon. Um, which is really one of the advantages, I think, of the social cost of carbon. It's also the case that if you're trying to convince countries, developing countries, about the imp likely impacts of temperature changes or why they should even want to you know, care about this at this stage of their development, you need to look ahead at damages. And clearly, if you're going to do a cost-benefit analysis, if you want to look at the benefits of adaptation and mitigation, you need to calculate the social cost of carbon. So I will stop there. Thank you very much, Maureen.